Okay, good morning, everybody. I think we can start with this uh, very, very passionate conversation that we have ahead. So, um, first of all, I would like to um, uh, briefly introduce myself so that you know who is going to be trying to uh, gear the conversation towards a very vivid discussion. Um, I am Giselle Burbano and I am one of UNESCO's uh, staff members in the field. I work from uh, the office in San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, dealing with all issues uh, related to social and human sciences in Central America. So lots of interesting work going on here. And um, of course, part of the work that we develop in the field uh, is related to the um, issue of uh, domestic violence, gender-based violence, and others that we will be dealing with today. So um, uh, before starting, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our distinguished guest speakers, Minister Bonetti, Mrs. Markovic, and Marco, you, I would like just to know if your mics and uh, your speakers and your headsets are working well, so that we start with the with the right foot. I cannot hear you. <laughs> if I can hear you, say yes, it works and that you hear me. Hello, Giselle and everyone. Nice to be with all of you. It's Umberto Carollo oh. here. Thank you, Umberto. So sorry I called you, Michael. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, Minister Bonetti, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Can you hear Great. me? It's okay. We hear you very well, yeah. Thank and uh, uh, Ms. Markovic, with the, could you, can you hear me? I can see in the chat that you cannot hear me. Perhaps you could check your settings to see if you could uh, eventually restart. Okay. The, let, let us give her just one little minute so that she can be fully participating together with all of us in our discussion. Just let us know uh, when you have solved the issue of the audio, Ms. Markovich, please. <clears throat> um, okay, um, I think that we can um, start and um, so, so that we can take full advantage of the short time that we have today and that we can also benefit fully from uh, Minister Bonetti presence who has uh, told us that she has other commitments uh, in something like 25 minutes. So it's very important that we can uh, start immediately. Um, a very quick introduction just to let you know all the participants here. Thank you very much. I see that the numbers are going up very quickly and this is very motivating and this is extremely exciting because it means that the topic that we're going to be dealing with today uh, is one of the 
more important ones in our daily work, in our commitment from our different perspectives. Uh, today's webinar is inscribed within a series that UNESCO of, of discussions that UNESCO is leading in order to tackle very pressing issues of uh, exclu um, exclusion, discrimination, violence during time of this pandemic, right, that has put us uh, in front of very difficult situations. Today, um, the discussion will evolve around mainly, mainly the issue of domestic violence, which most unfortunately, since the confinement measures across the world, has seen an increase in the numbers, which is very alarming. And the, the guest speakers are going to tell us how, from their different perspectives, they have contributed to tackle this very pressing issue. So um, I would like to very briefly, as I said, uh, welcome Minister um, Bonetti from Italy, um, Minister Elena Bonetti, she's the Minister of Equal Opportunities and Family since uh, September 2019. Uh, also, I would like to give a warm welcome to Ms. Senesana Samardic Markovic, who is the Director General of Democracy at the Council of Europe since 2002. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Umberto Carolo, who is the Executive Director at White Ribbon, uh, working very uh, in a very committed way to the issues of gender-based violence and others. Um, I would like to give the floor to the director of the Division of Gender Equality of UNESCO, who is going to address some welcoming words and who will uh, also be uh, paving the way to Minister Bonetti's um, introduction. Thank you very much. Welcome, uh, Mrs. Gulser Korat. Uh, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Giselle. Uh, warm greetings to everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to be connecting with all of you today. I'm based in Paris, so I'm coming to you from uh, Paris. Uh, it's wonderful to have so many of you connected via technology uh, to take part uh, in our efforts uh, to make sense of what is happening in the world around us. Uh, as a specialized agency of the United Nations system, uh, at UNESCO, we continue to take action uh, to bring all our stakeholders together so that we can address uh, some of the emerging challenges linked to this pandemic, uh, a pandemic which has affected all of us around the world in the past uh, few months. Some of you may know that uh, gender equality is one of two global priorities of UNESCO since 2008. Having it as a priority requires that all our work is informed by a gender equality perspective. Uh, during this pandemic, uh, some attention was paid to the uh, gender dynamics, gender uh, impact uh, of, of uh, what is happening, more than uh, it was done in previous uh, similar situations. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, coverage in the mainstream media, but also by uh, uh, researchers in different uh, research institutions around the world, looking at uh, some of the impact ranging from uh, the uh, uh, plight of uh, girls uh, in education uh, to domestic violence. Uh, unfortunately, uh, domestic violence has become uh, one of the key issues uh, related to this pandemic. So we decided to dedicate this virtual exchange uh, to the impact of the pandemic on uh, domestic violence specifically. I want to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues in the uh, social and human science sector of UNESCO uh, for taking the uh, initiative uh, to organize this meeting. As Giselle mentioned, uh, I am the Director uh, for Gender Equality at UNESCO, which is located in the uh, uh, Cabinet of the Director General, uh, which also indicates the importance UNESCO gives uh, to this uh, particular uh, uh, objective. Now, we do have some data. Although the data is scarce, uh, it's still very alarming regarding domestic violence. Uh, the situation is much uh, worse than in previous epidemics and outbreaks uh, because of the compulsory lockdown, which made it more difficult uh, for women and for other uh, uh, 
uh, vulnerable groups to escape their abusers. Uh, several reports suggest that uh, overall there is an increase of up to 35% in domestic violence as a result of confinement measures. Uh, due to the difficulty of uh, asking for help in the current circumstances, uh, the magnitude of the problem uh, of the phenomenon could even be greater. We have some data from uh, uh, different countries. In Lebanon, for example, it is reported that uh, domestic violence uh, doubled. In uh, Australia, it went up by 75%, which is an incredible uh, uh, figure. In France, we know that it uh, went up by a third, by about 30%. In South Africa, only on the, in the first week of the lockdown, there was an increase of 37% in domestic violence, and a similar surge is uh, reported in uh, Latin America. Uh, of course, the situation was equally bad for the LGBT communi community. Uh, they faced not only domestic violence and uh, parental abuse, uh, but also had to face additional discrimination and violence promoted by hate speech, some uh, going as far as blaming their sinful lifestyle for the pandemic. Preventing domestic violence uh, means tackling all of its different forms, not only sexual and physical, uh, but also psychological and economic. These different uh, forms of uh, violence can dramatically uh, affect the survivor's life. In fact, they do affect uh, the survivor's life especially in times of confinement, and should be addressed with specific measures. We believe that national and local authorities, civil society organizations, and international organizations all have a different role to play. This is why today's webinar, for today's webinar, we have called upon leaders and experts uh, from these backgrounds to explore what solutions they have to try, what has worked, and how uh, we can adapt some of these uh, different solutions uh, to fit different contexts. I'm sorry for the noise. Uh, I'm in a building where there is uh, renovation work being done. I had asked them to stop, uh, but they just started again. Uh, I hope you can still hear me. I just have a few more things to say, and then I'll stop. Uh, we are really honored to have the Minister for Equal Opportunities and Family from Italy, Ms. Elena Bonetti. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We do know that you have taken concrete measures uh, to fight against domestic violence since the very beginning of the crisis. And we hope to hear more about these initiatives to support the victims and to advance the gender equality agenda even in times of crisis. We are also delighted to have Ms. Neshana Smartvich Markovic, uh, the Director General of Democracy at the Council of Europe, and she joined us uh, on very short notice, so we are really grateful. We could not have imagined uh, having a meeting on domestic violence without the participation uh, from Council of Europe, uh, which has put into place the most comprehensive international framework, the Istanbul Convention. Uh, it's a convention that also has a personal meaning for me as it carries the name of the city uh, where I was born. Finally, I look forward to hearing from Mr. Humberto Carolo from the White Ribbon Campaign of different ways he has been working at the civil society level with men and boys to eradicate violence. This is also a form of violence, I guess, the noise. Domestic violence uh, is uh, indeed uh, not a woman's issue. I will quote a tongue-in-cheek phrase I read somewhere a long time ago and that stayed with me. And I quote, violence against women is one area where men do most of the work of violence and claim none of the credit, which is interesting, no? So at UNESCO, we do have a holistic approach to, to gender equality. We are the first United Nations agency to envisage a strong participation of men and boys in this field uh, with an expert group meeting that was convened on this topic back in 1997 in Oslo, Norway. And I'm really confident that uh, this conversation we will have today will add greatly to our ongoing work in this area. 
Without uh, further ado, I would like to thank you all again for joining us today. Apologize for the noise, and I look forward to this uh, fruitful discussion and turn the uh, floor over to uh, the ministers of Italy. Thank you very much. So, so thank you. Can you hear me now? It's okay, perfect. Thank you again for your kind invitation. Uh, I think that it is uh, very important to have the possibility and this opportunity to, to discuss about these uh, teams uh, that uh, are recognized uh, in all the world as a, an important uh, point we have to, to tackle also in this uh, COVID outbreak. Uh, as you know, Italy is a country that has been uh, greatly, severely affected by the COVID outbreak. And uh, you can uh, understand that uh, now we are uh, putting great uh, emphasis, in particular, uh, on the protection of the um, right to health for all. But uh, I have to say that uh, uh, we are um, experiencing uh, not only a health crisis, but a, a global crisis involving the economical part, but also our, let me say, uh, paradigm of uh, social lives. And in some sense, I have also to, uh, to say you that we are understanding that we have to change and to find a new paradigm of lives. And uh, this could be an opportunity, but at the same time, we have to know that uh, there is uh, a great risk. Uh, and the risk is that women, that could be key actors of the new, this new paradigm of renaissance for our society, on the contrary, could be the main victims of this crisis if uh, we do not act uh, in a right way to ensure uh, not only equ gender equality, which is really one of the goals of our development as the Agenda uh, 2030 has uh, affirmed, but also a, a great empowerment of women in our society. Let me also give you a datum, but I think that it is a datum not only for Italy, I think that it is uh, something which is uh, really common in other countries, that for instance, in uh, this month, uh, women have been uh, really uh, in the first line in the fight against COVID because in our hospitals, for instance, more or less the 70% uh, of employers are women. So uh, it, we, have, we can say that in Italy, the resistance to COVID has been in particular uh, has been possible through the work, uh, the great work and the hard work of women, uh, both in uh, supermarkets, but also in the hospitals. Now there is, um, we have to, to, the, to find a new direction to, to start uh, again our lives. And um, our idea is that uh, uh, it is necessary to promote a new way of uh, not only to find a justice between a work-life balance, but really to give uh, women uh, skills and instruments to be involved in the work, in the labor market, in the leadership position in uh, all the part of in politi politi in policy, but also in, um, for instance, in, in the, the work of the decision as the board of the entrepreneurship and so on. And there is also a, a change in the cultural paradigm concerning women. The, the first action I would like to, to tell about uh, is uh, the, uh, the fact that we have established in my ministry a new task force I have called it uh, Women for a New Renaissance. Is, uh, it is made by 12 women coming from different uh, fields, uh, science, uh, culture, economy, uh, and different uh, 
with different experiences and uh, the, um, the idea is that uh, this task force could give uh, and could produce some analysis and scientific uh, um, evidence relating to the impact of a COVID outbreak in particular on gender issues. Then we would like to formulate proposals um, to increase the presence of women in all the areas of work and in particular, for instance, in the fastest growing fields uh, as a STEM, computing, artificial intelligence. And we know that the presence of women in these fields could be um, a possibility for the real, a real empowerment of women uh, in our country. Then there is a problem of stereotypes in our country, but I think in the culture in general, and we have to contrast, contrast this kind of gender stereotypes to prevent, and, and this is a way also to prevent the fact that women are um, out for the possibility to reach leadership positions and we the main goal is to build a more inclusive and sustainable future for all of us let me also say that now we have also some data saying that this is not just a problem of justice the fact that i have some data that the fact that women's empowerment is recognized as a real uh, possibility to reach uh, a, a better future for all the society is now an evidence. So it is not just a way to ensure the presence of both men and women, but to ensure to our society the possibility to have really the contribution of all the energies of uh, the human energies given also by the uh, female presence in, uh, uh, in the society. It is, uh, uh, we have also um, the, the, the part which is uh, the part, uh, the negative part uh, concerning women and in particular regarding, as it is the subject of this call, the domestic violence and the based gender violence. Uh, it is true that the problem of violence against women presents different aspects. There is a psychological, a sexual violence, but also an economical violence. And the both, both aspects have uh, to be, uh, to take into consideration at the same time in an integrated strategy against the violence against women. Uh, when uh, we started in the very beginning of the outbreak, uh, we promoted a campaign to convince people to stay at home. Uh, the name was exactly, I stay at home, you rest a casa, uh, the Italian language, but at the same time, we promoted a campaign to say to women that they, they are not alone. Also in this moment in which they are forced to stay at home, if the, the, the house, if it is the, uh, the place of the violence, they can, they can exit, they can ask for help. And so we promoted the, the number, the toll-free number 1522, uh, which is active uh, 24 hours uh, a day. Uh, we used uh, all the, the social uh, media, the television to promote this campaign. And we, we had some results because for instance, in uh, April, I, we had more or less, uh, more than uh, 1,000 uh, asking for help from women, uh, victims of uh, domestic violence. And if we compare this datum with the April of the last year, we know, we recognize that there is a um, multiplication factor by three. Uh, this is uh, also, uh, we, we have uh, seen this datum also from a positive point of view that uh, the women now know that they can ask for help. And this is really the first step to have the possibility and the hope to exit from the violence for women and their children. Then the, we had to face the problems concerning the, 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 the pandemic. So we uh, promoted the, the possibility to find uh, specific uh, 
houses for women uh, to the um, to a, in a collaboration with the Minister of Interior and we uh, involved uh, all the prefectures and uh, as a ministry I uh, put some uh, uh, resources, uh, some funds to finance uh, for the, uh, to pay the, the expenses from the um, from the point of view of the anti-violence centers that we have in all the cities of, uh, of Italy. Uh, the, the second point uh, I, uh, I would like to, to focus is that we, we now are forced to think not just uh, regarding what has been what has happened do, during this month, but the possibility for women to to give some freedom, to have some freedom to um, to stay far from the house, which is the place of the violence. And so we, uh, we promoted a campaign um, to, to give money and to, to give the possibility of women to be involved in the uh, work and labor market. And this is a critical point. So we have to put some project, uh, some funds and to put in act some projects for the empowerment of these women. Because if we do not uh, uh, give the, uh, sufficient freedom to, um, to women to, to have the possibility to live alone, they, they couldn't have the possibility to, uh, to say no to the violence. So our campaign, Libera Puoi, that means uh, if you are free, you can. This freedom is not just a responsibility of the single women, it's really a possibility that all the society has to give to women to have the possibility to uh, overcome uh, the violence condition. Then uh, there is uh, now uh, other uh, actions we have put uh, uh, in our projects, uh, helping women for um, the so-called work-life balance, because you know that in Italy we have closed the school and in our society women are mainly uh, the main actors also for the home cares uh, and they, they take care of chi uh, child at home but now the, our families have been the place of the school, the place of the work, the place of the care in general and so uh, we have uh, promoted some action to help women to, to face this situation not alone saying that this is not a duty just for women, but there is a necessary uh, responsibility for men and women at the same time. So we have promoted parental leaves, for instance, for both men and women. We gave uh, uh, money for, to families to have the possibility of uh, um, using, for instance, babysitting uh, services. And during the summer, we, we are trying to organize some uh, uh, non-formal education opportunities for children to help families in general, and in particular to avoid uh, a, a risk we have that uh, women Live, we leave work to stay at home with children. This is a, a really a real negative risk, and uh, we are trying to, to avoid the, the, this uh, possibility. And um, finally, uh, in our uh, projects, we have also the possibility to uh, make a new strategy for uh, violence of uh, to. to for the contrast of violence against women, we in Italy we have a plan, uh, uh, a three years plan strategy, and now for this year we are in the last year of the last plan, and we are um, starting to uh, to make the project for the new one, and it is clear that. Uh, the experience of pandemic we have done and also the, the experience of pandemic with the risk of the violence, the increasing of violence in our houses will be uh, a focus for the new plan. So um, the direction are the same. Uh, we have to protect women. We, are, we have to prevent violence 
but uh, we also know that now we uh, have to give um, to promote empowerment of women so there is the prevention a protection but also promotion and the three pillars have to be developed uh, at the same way in a new integrated uh, vision that is uh, the, the core of our project for the future uh, to contrast uh, this uh, phenomenon. Thank you so very much, uh, Minister Bonetti. This is uh, not only inspiring, but um, so, so such targeted actions that respond to the phenomenon across the different areas that fit into the issues that we are dealing with today is uh, a very, um, as I said, accurate way of addressing these pressing issues. But seeing the leadership of women that are the ones putting this on the agendas of development of countries, uh, trying to make resurface what is evident and that has been lacking behind for so long. It's just a matter of uh, a great, I would say, courage and commitment. And we thank you for that. And uh, we believe that your voice will be one that will carry far with these very, very important um, measures that you are taking um, and that are being developed under your leadership. Uh, there is some questions. I know that you have to leave soon, so could you please tell me if you have five more minutes? Because we have uh, not many questions from the public, but it would be important that perhaps you can um, address them. Um, so five minutes would be okay, since you said that you had a little bit of yes, yes. time constraint. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Minister. So, with no further ado, I would like to give the voice to the to the um, participants of this uh, webinar, uh, which I thank very much for being here. Um, and I will try to sum up, uh, because some of the questions are very long, so I will try to sum them up so that the Minister can give an accurate and, and, and very um, targeted response. Um, there is a question uh, regarding the uh, domestic violence, but that um, also uh, is suffered by men. If there is any, if there is any data or any measures that have been taken on anything that has been observed as regards to violence, domestic violence suffered by men. Okay, in Italy, the violence against men is uh, uh, more related to the case of uh, uh, LGBT world. So we, we have uh, some gender-based and identity, gender identity violence, but, uh, uh, and uh, there is a, a project of law to contrast this uh, phenomenon, but uh, the, the violence against men uh, in, um, in domestic violence is not really, uh, we have a, a very small percentage. I think that it is uh, two or three sexual, uh, for instance, violence, the, the points are really uh, small. Let me say that there is another point I would like to, to underline concerning men is that uh, in our vision, there is uh, uh, also a necessary project to, um, to, to in, both in the prevention but also in the protection uh, to have some action on men, on, on the violence, on the violent men. So in our uh, project there are some uh, actors helping men to, uh, to overcome these uh, this attitude, which is a problem, we have centers for violent men helping them to uh, recover a positive way for a positive relationship with the women. And uh, uh, there is another point, which is a point also from the justice point of view, that is once you have some uh, clear evidence of violence at home, the possibility that it is the man to go out to the uh, to do go out from uh, the, the house and not uh, the women to protect the women uh, and the children but uh, also to um, let me say build 
a system which is a more uh, um, positive for children and the women uh, and in general with the women because otherwise uh, in general as i have already said the problem is that uh, women has not have not uh, sufficient money to live uh, alone because uh, all not always but uh, often in this kind of situation uh, women are also victims or victims of violence from the economic point of view they are not uh, the possibility to to use the money or to have some uh, uh, autonomous uh, financial uh, bank uh, account and so on Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this comprehensive answer, Minister Bonetti. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to say to all of the um, participants that are very eager actually to, to dialogue with you, Minister Bonetti, I must say, the, the, the questions are really piling up, but I know that um, the time will not allow us to respond and to address all the questions. So in advance, I would like to ask for um, apologies because uh, definitely all the questions for this specific chapter of the conversation today will not be able to be addressed. So I would like to um, also um, highlight the question of um, Sara Secchi, who uh, asks if the Italian government is providing guidelines against domestic violence to policy forces. Against policies forces, there is more the possibility. No, providing guidelines to the poly uh, to the police ah, okay. on yes, domestic yes. violence. Ah, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't understand. Yes, um, if I think that in Italy we have uh, um, a, a good governance of the project of uh, contrast uh, of the fight against uh, domestic violence, and in this governance there is um, all the actors are uh, in the same table and uh, I, I am the president of this uh, cabinet to, to, for the governance of the project and in, in this uh, there is also involved uh, the police uh, uh, forces, uh, police forces uh, but uh, also the education of, for instance the educational part, schools, uh, the part of the, for the health all the subjects involved in the in the in the in facing this kind of phenomena in this project there is a, a direction a pillars in which also we uh, invest uh, funds and resources and uh, actions um, regarding the formation the not, not just the guidelines the possibility of uh, giving the, uh, a specific formation and information for uh, the actors, uh, in particular, on, um, for instance, uh, how to deal with, in, how to relate with women which are victims of violence, because uh, th there is really a specific way in which you have to relate uh, yourself with a, a woman uh, who has been victim of violence in a house, uh, in the way in, you, in which you can, uh, for instance, ask uh, for instance, if you ask, uh, you, are you sure this, uh, it, it is not the right question, are you sure? Because a woman who has been victim of violence is not sure. And so there is a, a different psychological way, a different kind to, to find words, the right words and so on. And in this sense, there is really a strategic plan in which there is also this kind of action. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I am going to uh, go with the last question. As I said, not all questions can be answered today. I'm extremely sorry for that, but um, uh, time is uh, of the essence here. So I would like just to um, uh, convey to you, Minister, the, the question from Carmen Merlino, uh, who is a professor in Italy and a philosophy, history teacher, sorry. And she would like to know if there is any uh, policies for gender issues in regular programs at school, uh, if any impact on curricula is foreseen. This is one of the action of our plan to promote in uh, schools uh, uh, a good relationship between uh, uh, 
boys and girls uh, to avoid uh, hate speech because uh, also the problem of hate speech is uh, uh, re related to a sort of increasing uh, of uh, violence uh, or violent relation and uh, there are some programs some projects in schools we promote this kind of schools but uh, we have also uh, in our uh, project the the fact to uh, include in the uh, higher education i think to the universities for instance specific uh, uh, courses to to face and to promote to promote gender equality and to fight against stereotypes and violence against women many universities now um, have promoted this kind of uh, courses and in fr starting from the very beginning of schools uh, till the university uh, yes it is very important we have not a, a formal course for instance to promote uh, gender equality but uh, also the possibility to to change the paradigm in which we describe women and men in uh, for instance in books using used uh, on your uh, men so used by uh, by schools is very important so this is uh, not only a cultural i think that it is really an educational issue we have today Thank you very, very much, uh, Minister Bonetti. And uh, well, I'm going to start uh, thanking you for your presence, for your inputs, uh, for uh, these uh, reactions that the, the the interesting inputs that you have that you have been given ha have uh, provoked. I would like to um, just uh, tell everybody in this uh, webinar that let us remind and keep in our minds and actions something that was um, mentioned by Minister Bonetti, and I think it's it related to the change, change of paradigm. And uh, this is a message I think that uh, should stick with us, uh, we should apply to our everyday work, and uh, through the actions that the Minister uh, Bonetti has uh, showcased, it, it tells us how it's uh, possible to envisage a different society that is just, that is fair, that is uh, uh, sustainably developed. And maybe it's all related to this change of paradigm. And thank you so much, um, Minister Bonetti, for letting us, leaving us with this, uh, with this thought. We will definitely uh, think about it, continue discussing it. And uh, since I know that you have to leave, I would like to wish you uh, all the best. Uh, today thank you so much i know it's the afternoon for you so a great afternoon and uh, thank you to all the participants who addressed the questions to minister uh, we will try to see a way where we can eventually uh, answer to all those who got not answered uh, during the discussion today but thank you so much again um minister bonetti and um uh, i wish you again once more a great wonderful afternoon Thank you, but uh, I stay with you at, uh, at least uh, till uh, five, so... Okay. <laughs> follow the, the following discussion. No problem. In any case, uh, thank you thank so you. much, uh, also for staying a little bit longer then. So, uh, with no further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Sinzana. I'm so sorry if I'm not pronouncing this uh, well, but Ms. Sinzana Samartic Markovic. Uh, who is the Director General of Democracy at the Council of Europe and um, who is going to uh, uh, talk to us about the work, the very comprehensive work as uh, Director Korat uh, mentioned that the Council of Europe has been um, uh, developing and um, I would like to um, welcome her warmly. I hope she, yes, I see her. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Ms. Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. Do you hear me? Yes, very, very good. Well. Okay. So thank you as well. And uh, first, let me say hello to all the participants. Uh, uh, I'm very glad that uh, people are um, uh, so massively really interested in this uh, very, very important question. I'm grateful to UNESCO uh, for making this webinar uh, and taking uh, 
making it and uh, at least facilitating. And let me also say that recently um, uh, Minister Bonetti was in Council of Europe because Grevio, the monitoring mechanism of the uh, Istanbul Convention, was uh, visiting Italy and uh, it also published a report. And I want to say publicly too that there was uh, quite a, at least internal, but now this is an external recognition that Italy is also very much following the provisions of the convention and translating these provisions into law. This is something that I think it's very, very uh, good to, 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 to underline and uh, something that I, I think others uh, could follow more, <laughs> if I may say so. But I have to say our, our member states are very much committed uh, uh, and I'm proud of that. And when it comes to current pandemic and measures um, taken to, 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 to um, uh, contain uh, its spread, I think it shed light uh, on new concerns uh, in relation to domestic violence and, uh, of course, other vi uh, forms of violence against uh, women, including uh, women uh, exposed uh, uh, exposure to, to, to control of their perpetrators and also uh, women's further isolation from face-to-face -face support and uh, uh, also disruptions uh, of existing support services, something that also Madam Minister uh, spoke about. And in that context, it is more relevant uh, than ever uh, to uphold uh, the standards uh, of the Council of Europe Convention on Prevention uh, uh, and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, also called the Istanbul Convention, as Director Gustav Korat uh, correctly mentioned. And it needs to be stressed that the convention continues to be legally binding to all parties in time of conflict and, and pandemics. Um, so what have we done in the meantime? Uh, the monitoring bodies of Istanbul Convention, uh, uh, and we have two of them, one is Grevio, which, is, uh, uh, um, which are the independent experts, independent monitoring experts, and the other is the Committee of, of Parties, but they have different political role. However, both of them reacted so far uh, uh, and intervened in the debate uh, on the impact of the pandemic. Um, the president of Grevio uh, has issued uh, a statement uh, calling on parties uh, to the convention to uphold the standards during the, the pandemic. And she recalled, and I quote here, that restrictions on movement uh, offer abusers additional uh, 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 power and control over the women and girls uh, uh, they live with. Uh, and the Committee of Parties, the other monitoring mechanism, um, sort of, uh, political body rather, uh, the representatives of all 34 uh, state parties to the convention seat, uh, they issued a declaration expressing the will and determination of the state parties to stand by the convention and uh, provide uh, the uh, first guidance in a way to their action during the pandemic in line with these standards. And um, I can give you maybe two or three concrete uh, examples. Uh, so the first one, uh, the, our, our, our committee of parties, our political body said that parties must support and protect victims from further acts of violence and uh, secondary victimization by ensuring their access to information on available assistance and the functioning of special support services. And this includes um, the provision of medical assistance, uh, psychological and legal counseling, uh, sufficient places in shelters and uh, around the clock telephone uh, helplines. Um, then what, uh, what uh, was um, added still in this uh, uh, example, the committee parties recalled, uh, for instance, the need to consider in response to COVID-19, qualifying as essential uh, and uh, guarantee the con continuity of support services for women victims of violence and child witnesses while ensuring that they comply with applicable safety uh, guidelines. It also refers uh, uh, to the need to adjust financial and human resources allocated to service uh, provision, including those carried out by non-governmental sector. And specific measures have indeed been taken during the pandemic by many state parties, 
Italy, as we heard. And uh, um, uh, what we did in Capital of Europe, well, we uh, actually compiled these good experiences in uh, a resource web page. Uh, uh, it's on our, our Council of Europe webpage, Women's Rights and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So if anyone is interested. Um, um, also, alternative ways to deliver services uh, have been developed, uh, like the creation of um, helplines with the chat systems and remote counseling platforms to support victims. So this was all part of a, a first example. And um, second, example uh, uh, that committee of the parties uh, uh, insisted on uh, they said that conven uh, convention also provides for the uh, prosecution of uh, perpetrators of domestic violence and thus parties must provide uh, uh, dissuasive sanctions for acts of physical uh, uh, psychological sexual violence and must ensure that victims can report acts of violence and that uh, competent authorities carry effective investigation and um, order fast legal remedies to protect women at risk. Um, this includes uh, emergency barring orders, uh, removing the perpetrators from the home, as well as uh, protection uh, uh, orders for, for victims. Uh, while uh, the pandemic uh, has caused uh, uh, the uh, activities of men in national courts to slow down, initiatives can be taken to prioritize the safety of women uh, victims and uh, also of their children. Examples of online tools for reporting offenses already exist, like uh, in Austria or France, and new channels, for instance, uh, via the use of code words uh, at uh, pharmacies, uh, like in Spain or France, have been uh, created for women to report uh, violence uh, during the uh, lockdown. Um, what the uh, convention also uh, uh, does, it, uh, it requires uh, the implementation of coordinated policies among all relevant actors. Uh, it is then particularly interesting to notice that uh, various state parties or uh, signatories have set up task forces, like um, say in Belgium and uh, Switzerland, or dedicated uh, national emergency plans, like in Ireland or the Lithuania or Spain, to respond to domestic violence during the, the pandemic. And um, another obligation of the convention is to make, uh, to take measures uh, to prevent, prevent violence against women. Um, it is then uh, particularly relevant uh, to stress that some countries have devoted time to carry special awareness uh, uh, raising campaign on violence against women during the pandemic. Uh, uh, Minister Bonetti mentioned exactly one of very, very important uh, uh, awareness raising uh, campaign. Well, the same did Ireland and Spain, which I mentioned before. Uh, but there is one group uh, indeed that is particularly vulnerable and, uh, um, or not one, but several actually particularly vulnerable uh, groups such as uh, uh, women uh, uh, with disabilities and migrant women and uh, maybe we i could just say um, a few words there that uh, uh, are uh, under uh, under uh, even already under non-emergency uh, circumstances uh, uh, the monitoring mechanisms of istanbul convention um, had shown that women in situation of vulnerability um, are exposed to, of course, multiple discrimination. And they, as I said, they are women with disabilities, uh, women belonging to national minorities, uh, women in prostitution, uh, migrant and asylum seeking women, elderly women too. And uh, of course, they are very, even more at risk uh, uh, of violence uh, uh, and even face more barriers uh, to their access to support uh, uh, services and, uh, and uh, justice uh, in the COVID uh, uh, circumstances. Um, and um, of course, 
crisis tends to increase uh, existing inequalities and uh, um, the emerging negative effects of the pandemics and containment, uh, containment measures uh, um, uh, already uh, even just augment uh, uh, these barriers that, uh, that uh, these women uh, face. And for instance, uh, what Grevio identified uh, is a recurrent problem uh, uh, during its monitoring is uh, the limited support services available for women without a res residence permit. In some countries, the support uh, available to these women is extremely limited, as they cannot access any of the general social services or other support services such as shelters. So during the pandemics, it is uh, even more present and it is, I think, essential to ensure that women's uh, administrative situation do not prevent them from seeking and, and uh, receiving the help they need. And um, um, as concerns asylum, Grevio has constantly highlighted difficulties experienced by state parties in uh, assuring gender-sensitive asylum determination procedures and gender-sensitive reception facilities. Um, taking into account these uh, pre-existing problems, uh, 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 the Declaration of Committee of the Parties uh, to the Istanbul Convention has stressed that special efforts should be made to ensure asylum-seeking women's access to information and support services for any experience of violence uh, uh, in, reception, in reception facilities. And just me, let me mention briefly uh, the women with disabilities who are victims of violence. Uh, um, I think they face additional discrimination uh, and are likely to be marginalized from existing services such as shelters or helplines uh, because their exclusion from super, uh, support services is often tied to their lack of access to information. And when I say that, I mean in the format that they understand. Um, therefore, um, ensuring the provision of accessible information and support for women with uh, physical, mental, or sensory disabilities um, who face violence is a timely concern in the context of the pandemic. And some states, I have to say, have taken initiatives to this effect. But um, in general, this seems not to be uh, sufficiently visible among states' uh, priorities uh, in their reaction. So this is, um, this is something that I wanted to say uh, in the beginning, and um, I think this is now a bit very important to underline the role of uh, NGOs working with uh, these uh, groups of women at risk or uh, women of multiple uh, discrimination risks. And um, uh, one thing maybe is important to mention that uh, we need the gender disaggregated, disaggregated uh, data in order to be to have better picture uh, uh, of uh, post-COVID uh, uh, um, situation and COVID, but uh, post-COVID and long-term situation, because we are still too much into the pandemic uh, uh, to be certain about its long-term impact. But data collection. Uh, will be essential to add uh, evidence-based action uh, um, uh, and for our future action. So with this, uh, I, would, uh, I would end uh, the introduction and I'm open, of course, for, for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Markovic, and, and uh, so many important things that you have highlighted. First of all, I, I would like to say that um, knowing that there is a convention that address all these issues in a very comprehensive way is a, a very important step towards, towards uh, tackling pressing issues as the one we're discussing today, right? Um, in the case of uh, just uh, uh, to, to feed into the conversation, in the case of Central America, we are addressing together with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the issue of violence uh, and discrimination exclusion that has been exacerbated during the time of pandemics, specifically on women with disabilities. And, mm -hmm. um, and this is a very um, um, worry, worrisome uh, uh, issue that the, the Office of the High Commissioner of human rights has all also addressed because uh, dealing with the respect and protection of the 
uh, fundamental rights of everybody, but specifically of those uh, in situation of vulnerability, has been uh, proven to be of the utmost importance in the context of this pandemic. So this is definitely in line with what you mentioned as framework of action and different actions uh, undertaken by uh, countries, as we heard from Italy and others that have given the good example of applying what is in the convention, right? And I see definitely there where we can try to build some um, cooperation between the countries we serve for, from UNESCO, from the South, and those that you cover from the uh, perspective of the Council of Europe, of Europe. We can definitely have this conversation further on. So um, I would like to um, um, read out loud some questions that have been uh, put here in the chat. Um, so, uh, Lubomir Krilchev does not say from where uh, he is, but uh, would like to know if um, how European states that have ratified the Istanbul Convention are handling the situation on domestic violence and gender-based violence compared, com compared sorry, to those countries who have not ratified the Convention. So, if you have already some data on this specific point. Well, I already mentioned that there are signatories. Uh, they have not ratified, but they are signatories uh, uh, of the convention. Uh, and uh, of course, it is much easier for um, us in Council of Europe to um, uh, have a good uh, view on what is going on when it comes to those who have, who have ratified. But uh, uh, then, of course, then those who haven't yet. Uh, but... Uh, uh, the point is there to be able then to, for those who have ratified, to fight against violence together. While those who haven't ratified, they are still kind of uh, uh, separate in a way, you know, and they don't have access to the uh, uh, committee of parties discussion or to the monitoring as a matter of fact, because monitoring is not just naming and shaming, it's also assessment need in a way, and it helps member states. So I think that those who have not uh, ratified, they are in a, in a bit of a, um, a more difficult situation when it comes to tackling this problem, uh, meaning as, as all together and in a structured way. But provisions of the convention are still there. They could be applied even if somebody didn't ratify, they could make a law that is uh, um, kind of in accordance with, uh, with um, the Istanbul Convention. However, and maybe not everybody will like what I, uh, I want to say, but uh, I think that apart from um, uh, uh, increasing the problem with the domestic violence, uh, uh, COVID crisis has also shown that this is a place for state to react as well. This is not something that uh, uh, is just private uh, business, sorry to say so, private affairs, but states have to react. I think that was clear. Yes, definitely. I think it, the, the message is very, very clear and, and um, uh, we'll very much hope that it goes through and that actions are taken uh, immediately within the framework of the convention that, that you're representing today. So there is another question um, as regards to the women who have been already victims of domestic violence prior to the COVID uh, situation, uh, whose uh, uh, situation has worsened because of the confinement and the pandemic uh, consequences. And so do you have any feedback on how member states, those that are perhaps the, more act, the most active within the framework of the convention, are uh, thinking of or planning on addressing the issue after the hot point of the pandemic is um, solved, if <laughs> so, uh, like Italy already mentioned, the plan that is you no know, more a medium long term uh, plan to, to continue tackling the issue so as to find the stop. Perhaps, do you have any other feedback from other countries that are on, uh, working on the same line? Well, I already mentioned uh, that uh, some of the member states uh, have uh, uh, parties to party to convention. They have already uh, um, some of them, three or four, have uh, uh, action plans. Like Italy is mentioned, but others they have action, clear action plans. So it's not just uh, an adopted, which means there is a structured approach toward the issue. Um, we uh, already have uh, uh, experiences from some of the member states, uh, I will not name which ones, uh, but they, for example, have 
undertaking serious measures during the, the, the COVID to replace uh, the perpetrators from homes. So they couldn't, if they couldn't pr uh, pr provide the shelter, they would kind of take the perpetrators from homes, from the, but, but everybody is isolated. But for the future, uh, uh, and that is the beauty of those who have ratified, they can sit together and exchange good practice. How to address uh, uh, the, this? Uh, 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 as I said, there are some that have plans, but COVID, uh, I think, uh, uh, activity will be when the courts start to work again actively to give priority in further prosecuting uh, uh, those uh, who are accused of, of uh, violence. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, we're going to go with uh, a combination of two questions as last question. So, um, uh, is there any type of enforcement of this mechanism? Uh, I guess when you mentioned the aspect that of legally binding, it, it's related to that. But uh, if there is uh, any type of enforcement, would like to know, Leslie Wright and Nathaniel. Um, Subida from the Philippines is curious about the um, how uh, the situation of healthcare workers is dealt with from the perspective of the convention. Well, there is no any special uh, um, uh, point of view from the convention, you know, uh, when it comes to health workers, uh, but. Uh, um, because they are particularly, as Minister uh, uh, Bonetti mentioned, they are particularly exposed. Uh, uh, but comment, uh, I mean, there must be particular attention. But convention is uh, there for all uh, uh, victims uh, 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 of violence. Uh, what uh, is very, very important, and then uh, uh, it can be the answer to the questions from Philippines. Uh, Istanbul Convention envisages coordination. Uh, of uh, many uh, ministries and agencies, uh, state agencies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that is uh, a demand. Some of our member states have problems when ratifying uh, a convention uh, because it's really demanding to put in place coordination mechanisms to be sure that uh, uh, it's not just the Ministry of, of um, uh, Gender Equality or Social Affairs, depending when this question is uh, uh, administratively located in the government, but Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Health, many other ministries uh, uh, and agencies are coordinated. This is for persecution, but also for prevention. And uh, um, that is, I think, uh, one of the stronger parts of Istanbul Convention. There is a clear demand. It's not an option. But when you ratify, you have to have it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Markovic. I think that uh, we, we got a very, very clear picture of the um, comprehensive work done uh, through the lenses of this convention uh, with your leadership. And this is uh, something that um, continues building the, the clear picture of the discussion that we're having today. Thank you so much for that. Uh, all questions remain unanswered. Uh, we're sorry for that, but we will try to provide you with an answer perhaps with uh, so, some other way. Um, uh, I would like now to, um, after having thanked again, uh, Ms. Markovic, to I'm I would like to now uh, give a warm welcome to Mr. Umberto Carolo, uh, Executive Director from White Ribbon, who is going to provide us with a, a different perspective yet of uh, how this issue is being tackled from um, the lenses of uh, the organization that you represent today. Thank you so much, Umberto, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Giselle. Are you able to hear me? Okay, yes. great. So thank you to you colleagues and, and uh, fellow panelists. I'm, uh, it's a tremendous honor to, to be part of this important dialogue. So greetings from Toronto, Canada, where I'm based. And um, 
and I would say that uh, that uh, the the information, the words that I'm going to be sharing, are complementary to the strategies that have um, already been talked about. And and I think this is an important principle for all of us to keep in mind that the work with men and boys needs to be complementary to programming and policies and initiatives and strategies that uh, work directly with women and survivors and including uh, children. So it should never be done as a replacement for that. Um, and uh, we, we know that, uh, that women and children experience a disproportionate amount of violence at the hands of men. And that violence has always been there and it's been exacerbated by the current pandemic. So let us let us not forget that. And also that not everyone experiences men's violence uh, equally, that uh, women are disproportionately impacted by it, but children, um, members of the LGBTQ community, uh, racialized communities, uh, uh, women with disabilities and, and so forth. So that's really important to keep in mind as we think about ways to uh, engage with men and boys on this issue. And the other uh, important principle that I would uh, like to emphasize is that uh, when it comes to engaging men and boys in promoting gender equality and ending gender-based violence, let's not forget of the end goal, which is to end that inequality that exists between men and women in our societies um, and uh, redress those inequities and, and, and uh, drive, create, promote a world that has uh, equal opportunities for people of all genders. Um, and, and so we need to address uh, uh, these issues at a high level, at a systemic level, but also we need to do a, a lot of work at the individual level as well to change behaviors and attitudes um, and uh, to ensure that, uh, that those drive change at, uh, at higher levels. So in other words, we need to take an intersectional um, and uh, socio-ecological approach to engaging men and boys. We need to think about um, how men's use of violence is impacted by their own identities, by their own locations in, in society, uh, by their own experiences as well, often. Um, but uh, also to think about um, initiatives and strategies that we can implement at the individual level, at the group level, at the community level, institutional, and all the way to policy level. So I would like to give some examples of, of how this can be done even within the current context of a pandemic, but certainly um, uh, as, a, as an ongoing basis. So obviously there is a lot of uh, violence happening in the home as we've been hearing about and, and, um, and reading in, in statistics and so forth. And in my own country here in Canada, we, we know our, our own government has shared that uh, rates have increased anywhere between 20 to 30% in certain jurisdictions within, within Canada. So, um, and um, we know what the uh, roots of that violence are, obviously, uh, and that is, as I mentioned, the, the inequality that already exists in our society, in our communities, and in our homes, that uh, men have uh, control over, over family life, uh, that men um, uh, play a dominant role in many, many cases, and when uh, something uh, goes wrong, that men use violence of different kinds, wh where, where, whether it be uh, physical violence or psychological violence or threats or, or sexual violence or uh, economic violence to, uh, to gain that control back. Um, and we know that um, uh, in many cases that men's own sense of identities as a provider, uh, for example, is, um, is challenged when they lose employment as a result of the current uh, pandemic, for example, or where, when their employment status becomes uh, precarious. So um, this also introduces stresses into the family, into uh, people's lives that may uh, lead to men using uh, greater uh, rates of, of violence, especially where they were already at risk for using that violence or where there was already a little bit of conflict perhaps in, in the home, it can be uh, certainly exacerbated by conditions like the current one. 
So um, in order to prevent that violence from escalating, we need to also give men the tools, the information and the tips to help them better deal with their own, their own stresses. So in terms of, of working with men during this pandemic, uh, using tools like social marketing campaigns, for example, uh, can be very effective in giving men um, tips on what to do when they get stressed out, when things get out of hand, what are some of the alternatives, what can you do instead of using violence and control and screaming and yelling, you know, what are some of the uh, healthy ways that men can address uh, those, those issues um, and what to do. So if you've used violence, how do you become accountable? How do you reach out for help? How do you check in with a person that was harmed? What can you do to apologize and, and to make sure that you don't use violence anymore? Um, what, are, what is the role of neighbors and family members and friends in checking in on their loved ones? Um, so if, if they know that someone is at risk of, of, uh, of experiencing violence, what can other men in the family, whether it be uncles or fathers, what, they, what can they do as active bystanders in reaching out to the family member and saying, how are you doing? Um, how are you feeling? You know, checking in on them. That's, that's really important because that leaves the door open for women and children to share uh, experiences with them and then to, for, for other family members to, to come to, uh, to provide some support. Obviously, there is the role of, of the police and, and uh, community organizations. And, and as I mentioned, accountability is very important. And if men have used violence, then they need to be held accountable. Uh, they need to be removed from the home and they need to be uh, given the right accountability uh, support in order to change their behaviors. Because otherwise, if they're just removed and charged and perhaps given some sort of sentence, how will that prevent them from continuing to use violence in the future with future partners or return to the home and, and uh, use violence yet again with their, with their family members. So that needs to be taken into account. And, and then from there, you know, at the community level, we need to think about the context in which people live, uh, go to school in and work in, right? So what is the role of, of educators um, in supporting uh, children who've experienced violence and checking in on children, but also making sure that children are not experiencing that kind of violence in their own school um, at the hands of their peers or their educators. Um, in the workplace, the same thing. What can men do to address sexual uh, harassment, as an example? And, and, and there's all kinds of um, strategies that can be used from workplace campaigns to ensuring that HR policies are uh, inclusive of violence prevention in the workplace, that survivors are given the right kind of supports and access to programs in order to, to help them address uh, the violence that they experience. And then uh, at a higher level, at the policy level, and, and uh, my two fellow panelists have also have already mentioned some of those strategies, the importance of, of policy, of, of national gender-based violence prevention plans and plans that also include primary prevention with men and boys, that, are, that, that needs to be complementary to initiatives and, and uh, policies that support women survivors, that provide the longer term empowerment. Um, as Minister Bonetti was, was talking about, we need to, to also be inclusive of, of prevention, primary prevention to make, to make sure that that, um, that kind of uh, violence doesn't happen in the first place. Uh, so we at White Ribbon in Canada are, we tend to work more at the individual and work level. So our campaigns are focused on behavior and attitudinal change and in, in uh, encouraging men to become allies, to become good role models and to be a good ally to, means to work in partnership with women and women's organizations to support and build on the work that's already being done and, uh, and for men to be, um, to stand in solidarity with survivors to believe survivors, to offer to support, um, and, and do so much more, and, and to be allies in, in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in, in ending this kind of violence, to speak out against it, to challenge their peers when they hear someone say something sexist or uh, homophobic or, or racist, uh, again, recognizing the, the intersectionality of this problem. 
and then to be good role models. So uh, men need to, um, to, to know that young people are looking up to them, especially those very close to them, their sons, their daughters, their young people in their life. Uh, and they need to demonstrate through their actions in the home, uh, their interactions, that uh, what it means to be equal, what it means to be a gender uh, equal, uh, equitable ally, to participate equally in family life, in, in family responsibilities, um, tr to treat their partners with respect, not to use violence, to, uh, to share equally in, in caring for children and the household chores. Um, we know that uh, you know, under uh, normal circumstances, women uh, bear the, the, um, the, the uh, largest uh, brunt of uh, family life and responsibilities. That needs to be equalized. Men need to step up and, uh, and, uh, and support and, uh, and uh, um, play an equal role in cooking and cleaning and caring for children and upbringing, um, helping upbringing and, and taking parental leave, yes, and, and helping their, their partners uh, continue their, their careers and, and support them along the way. So I will leave it there because there's so much more to say, but uh, I, would, I would love to answer some questions. And, um, and I invite everybody to check our website at whiteribbon.ca. Uh, for examples of those campaigns that I've been talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Umberto. This, uh, this uh, gives us uh, yet another perspective of comprehensive work that uh, is being done. Um, uh, and um, I think that we would like to hear if you can do it like in one minute <laughs> a little bit more about this uh campaign that you have uh, called boys don't cry yeah so you know one of one of the things we need to think about doing uh in in terms of addressing this issue preventing it from happening in the first place is we need to look at how boys and young men are socialized from a very young age. It's, uh, uh, you know, our parents, the media, our educators, uh, we have, we, we all grow up with certain kinds of expectations related to our gender, right? So in the case of boys, they are encouraged to become real men, to become tough, to become athletic, uh, to um, win at all costs, to never back down, to always being in control and uh, uh, unemotional to their um, young men and, and uh, uh, young adults are celebrated for their uh, sexual prowess at, uh, you know, as they're uh, growing up. And while girls are uh, celebrated in other ways, they're encouraged to express vulnerability. They, uh, they, it's okay for them to seek help when needed, to be subservient, to value certain careers over others, and to be guarded about their sexuality. And of course, these are generalizations, and I don't mean to say that everybody grows up that way, but certainly a great deal of, uh, of us uh, do grow up that way. And uh, so uh, Boys Don't Cry is a campaign that helps to highlight the harmful impacts of those uh, rigid gender stereotypes and norms. And what does, so what does it mean for us to tell a young boy that, uh, to grow up to be a real man, stop crying, you know, what does that mean in terms of, of giving boys uh, freedom to express their emotions, sadness, uh, and, and anger and frustration, right? So if boys can't cry because they're not real men, then how do they deal with stress and with anger, right? So this is where the other harmful norm is, comes into play, which is, you know, if someone uh, challenges you, fight back. Right. Use your control and your dominance and your strength to fight back. Don't let anybody put you down. Right. So we all grow up with this. And so this translates into then young men and adult men using those kinds of strategies to resolve conflict in their relationships in their homes. So we're just talking about the rise of you know, violence in the, in the home as a result of this pandemic. So we have whole generations of boys and young men who grow up um, without uh, being in touch with their own emotions and, and uh, believing that the only way that they can assert themselves is through dominance, dominance, control, and violence. So when something goes wrong, those kinds of um, 
ways of, of being come to the surface. So Boys Don't Cry is a three minutes long uh, video that I encourage everybody to see. It's difficult to watch, but it takes us through the life of a young person from the time they're born all the way into their um, adult uh, years. And it, uh, it demonstrates how these uh, harmful stereotypes and norms have an impact on the lives of young women and girls along the way, but also on the, on the lives of men and boys themselves. Because we know that, that this has a tremendous negative impact on the lives of women, girls, and LGBTQ community members, but we know this is very damaging for, our, for, the, for the health, the mental health of, of boys and young men and men themselves. So gender equality is good for everyone. It, we can all benefit from it. Uh, healthy relationships and equal homes and equal workplaces and an equal society everyone benefits, especially those that have been traditionally left behind. Uh, women, girls, uh, racialized communities, LGBTQ communities, people with disabilities, uh, indigenous uh, women and girls. Um, yes, they will benefit, but we men and boys will benefit from getting rid of these uh, harmful stereotypes and gender norms and getting rid of this violence once and for all. So we have to step up as allies, strong allies and work alongside uh, women's organizations and, and leaders and, uh, and, and works uh, hard to uh, bring about change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Umberto, for this, uh, for these very encouraging words. I believe that uh, it was the perfect closure to, to, to the very important inputs that you provided us with today. Um, I would like to invite you, Umberto, if you can, in the chat, put uh, the link to the campaign so that people can access easily. And, um, and definitely, please, I invite you also, I would like to second Umberto's invitation to consult and check their website. They do a beautiful, amazing work on this um, issue of involving men and boys to achieve gender equality, which is actually not necessarily the work that is the most widespread out there, but so necessary that uh, it will increase in importance, definitely. So uh, we are approaching the end of this passioning uh, exchange. I didn't see the time uh, running by, and of course I have uh, all the helpers telling me that I should keep with the watch. If it were me, I would have continued this discussion for hours and hours because uh, this is just uh, extremely interesting, useful, I hope, for all here participating. And um, uh, uh, before giving the floor to uh, Ms. Angela Mello, Director of, for Programs in UNESCO in the Social and Human Sciences Network, uh, uh, sorry, sector, um, I would like to thank once more the distinguished guests, the speakers, all the participants. And um, I now give the floor to uh, my dear director, Angela Mello, who has the task of uh, sending us back home <laughs> to continue working on this very important endeavor that gather us together today. Angela, please. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Giselle. Thank you, distinguished speakers, Ms. Markovic, and Mr. Carollo, dear participants, thank you for your time and for your contribution to this webinar series. It was a very good and, and the, for me, it's a, it was a very excellent, it's excellent experience. And ladies and gentlemen, today is a time for joining efforts. This is time for bringing together all member states, international organizations, civil society actors, private sectors, stakeholders, community and religious leaders, young men and women leaders, and all the women and men non-binary persons of our society to tackle uh, gender-based and domestic violence. When governments adopt lo uh, lockdown measures to face the COVID-19 outbreak, we confined ourselves in our homes to remain safe. And some of us can ask what, which, which homes? We, because we are supposed to be safe in our homes. Yet, home is exactly where some intimate partners became abusers and where women and girls in quarantine times become survivors of domestic 
uh, abuse, including sexual assault and rape. On 5 April 2020, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called us for a ceasefire, using this word, in facing of horrifying global search in domestic violence. This development comes at the time when capacity of domestic violence shelters and social and medical systems to survivors may be reduced as past endemics such as Ebola and Zika have shown us. But we cannot let history repeat itself. Innovative and comprehensive measures to ensure that the crisis such as COVID-19 no longer reinforce the vulnerability of women and girls. This is our crucial. All our efforts must be extended to uphold their basic human rights and to provide them with the universal and safe access to quality protection and services. We hear we heard here good part, excellent practices through the Minister of Italy presentations, particularly my, my appreciation went to when she and also the uh, Mrs. Uh, Markovic uh, uh, ex uh, show us examples on some member states who already put in place work plans, very structured to protect and to prevent violence against women, including domestic violence. So we will take advantage of these good practices, we'll make analysis and further developed and repli replicated wherever re relevant and possible. UNESCO's function rests on supporting member states to build back better with concrete policy recommendation, recommendations sorry, based on such practices. For example, we talk about the certain tools to tackle domestic violence, new technologies, Artificial intelligence should be also keen in order to improve and to, to prevent women from violence. Women survivors of domestic abuse can also be helped using uh, their smartphones. For example, in the rural areas, uh, in Africa particularly, we, the uh, uh, service on new technology has already uh, improved and we can protect women from abuses of violence. Of the uh, uh, violence. Uh, yet our director of the uh, Division of Gender Equality said earlier, however, we lack much need data. Data is very important. We have to pledge to strengthening capacity of statistics infrastructures in our country and research centers that will collect it gender disaggregate data and develop gender transform transformative research on social economic roots and impacts on pandemic and uh, post pandemic as well and also as you said uh, uh, Giselle also to develop scientific cooperation south south and north south cooperation this is very important in improving data evidence based uh, research which is our uh, one of the, our program most to build capacities and to show evidence to inform policy uh, policy making in order to enable policy makers to better support women survivors of violence also we have the experience on uh, a methodology methodologic approach multi stakeholder participatory mechanisms that you can monitor and, uh, and uh, the implementation of these policies. As said, Mrs. Uh, Markovic, the point is also we, we, should, we should have a critical mass on how we are going, what, what is going, what is works well, and uh, also to monitor. And monitor is also to assess, as you said, Mrs. Ms. Markovic, uh, monitor is assess needs. This is what we need to do more on this. And also to pledge to actively promote inclusion and participation of women and men on same footing at local, national, regional and global decision making. To go further to these points. Uh, ending uh, violence against women is 
is back and forth gains and loss. We are, we are uh, to be expected in our struggle for gender equality. It's a long-term endeavor. We need to change mindsets and mind, mindsets, as you said properly, uh, uh, Mr. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Carolo is very, what you said is true. Change mindsets uh, means change stereotypes, habits, gender norms, stereotypes. And I really appreciate your perspective. You, bring, you, you brought with the interesting perspective and in, and, uh, in associating men and, uh, men and boys in our endeavors. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation as well. Education is key. We need to, to really, really educate our children at the very beginning, at the very early stage, young women and men, and also to move with the uh, combined policies, punishing to, to uh, combat through the uh, laws and at the same time preventing measures. That uh, this is what the Minister of Health of uh, uh, Italy, she explained that you have to combine all the tripartite uh, issues. Um, we also would like to recognize the women are at the front, uh, front lines to address pandemic. And this is recognition of their work that their capacity to also uh, move, along, move ahead in transforming societies. Not just complain that we are uh, victims or survivors or whatever, but move ahead. And this is what we, we have seen and experienced through the, across the world. For example, some countries uh decide to revisit the, their policies in recognition of human uh, women works at uh, front lines of the fighting this pandemic so thank you so much for joining us today on this special edition of the international webinar series of the social and human science sector for unesco and also, uh, we, it was organized in, in the conjunction with the, jointly with the Division for Gender Equality, as the uh, director said, and also uh, excellencies and uh, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, you are invited to attend our next webinar that will take place on Friday at 4 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Uh, related to the uh, the title is Art Lab for Human Rights and Dialogue, with the presence of the renewed artists and cultural actors from all over the world. I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear uh, director. Um, this uh, this uh, very very. Um, uh, committed words uh, invite us to remember three things that I would like all the participants to bring with them. Change of paradigm, crucial role of men and boys for gender equality and the responsibility of state. I think that we have the opportunity, all of us, to make a change. Let us be part of that change as change makers. So uh, thank you again. Uh, and please be present at all the other webinars that are to come, which are highly interesting. And uh, you will always be our guests. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you all of Goodbye. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Nice to see you all. Take nice care. To see all the best. You we'll continue to work together, right? Lo absolutely. Nice Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Makovic as well. I appreciate your presentation. It's a regional uh, perspective, but very helpful for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Giselle, thanks. Keep in touch. Thank all you. the best. Bye-bye. Thank you.